Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free. Toll-free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hi, everybody. This is Jennifer Solis. Welcome to this week's Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Um, to my right is my co-host, Kurt Dukoch, Raymond Fletcher, and our producer, William Beach Baker. Behind our boards and on our phones, we have Lawrence. He's the one that makes everything sound great for us. Woo-hoo. All right. So yay, what is... Yay, Lawrence. Yay, Lawrence. <laughs> I was going to say, what is the biggest news we've had in Las Vegas all week? Hemp Fest! Fest. <laughs> if you were not there, you missed. And did they not say it was larger than Seattle's first Jonathan Davis did say it was larger than Seattle's first hemp fest and that um, there were waves of smoke coming off the off the uh, crowds. And you know what? People didn't want to show up because they said they're being too washy, wishy washy. It's a gray area. I don't want to be able not to medicate. Where's the tent? Why? Why? Well, I know when I was sitting in the VIP area. (laughs) Because you know you're a VIP. I am a VIP. Uh, I could just see the the clouds of smoke over the amphitheater of the Clark County Government Center. Wasn't it a beautiful sight? And if you were not medicating, you did not need to. All you had to do was just go through the cloud and, and, and enjoy the moment. You know, and that that's what was so exciting to me because we were sitting in the Clark County Public Amphitheater, or, you know, the Clark County Government Amphitheater, and in the Government Amphitheater, everybody was getting medicated. You know, and, and I really enjoy doing a, a, a act of civil disobedience, you know, in the name of civil rights. We as patients have a right to safe access to our medication, to safe information, to be educated. And there were a lot of information booths out there. It was just, it was just insane. It was great. Uh, the whole little pyramid was uh, that had information booths that had patients' rights and advocacy b- groups. Um, and of course, we had Weed TV there. Woo! Joining us, joining us in our studio now is Mark Bradley. He is the CEO of. Um, Players Network here in town. It's an 18-year-old company that's a publicly traded company. Let Mark explain kind of what what's going on here. What what is Players Network and what is Weed TV and what's your vision? Uh, Players Network is a uh, media and technology company that originally started out inside hotel rooms teaching people how to gamble. Thus, the name Players Network. Uh, we expanded our first big brand called vegas on demand which is now in 104 million homes you could see it on comcast you could see it on hulu you can see it on a lot of major uh, networks both over the top television which is broadband as well as cable and uh, we recently created our new baby network uh, five months ago called weed tv uh, dedicated to the both legalized um, uh, medical marijuana recreational and really to cover the growth of this industry well at, at hemp fest you guys were all over the place i saw your i saw your t-shirts i saw people running around and of course the vip area you guys were doing exclusive interviews and a live stream uh, uh, of hemp fest so those people that were kind of that couldn't make it out to hemp fest you could see the whole thing for free on weed tv and i think that you guys are doing are you doing a, a rebroadcast uh, yeah we uh the hemp fest thing came together just really in the last minute and we didn't really uh have the time to properly market it so 
we had a nice audience, but we decided to rerun the broadcast because it was just so good. We had so many celebrities and point of views and different people that was were lecturing in different uh, seminars and the artists themselves um, just did some great interviews. And since it was live, you only got to see it once. So we're beginning Friday afternoon. We're going to rebroadcast it on WeedTV.com. And, and it's just it's a lot of fun. We had a good time out there and got some great uh, content. Well, that's really great. And it's also really good for people who um, may have not been able to get out of their house. If they, if you're not ambulatory, if you're a patient, if you're sick, you'd like to see what went on and, and make your own hip fest at home, light up and watch it on Weed TV on Friday. Yeah, well, uh, we, you know, we're looking to get into a lot of original programming, not, you know, music events and certainly information in the industry is, is one aspect. But we also um, want to focus on being an entertainment network. So we're going to create a lot of original shows that you would think would be on regular TV. For example, we're going to do our, um, like, let's call it our, our medical version of Dr. Oz or Sanjay Guto, you know, yeah. where you're sitting down with medical professions and talking about real medicine. For sure, and, and and there is a lot. Of, there are a lot of different rooms for for different channels, not just the the Wayne and Garth. But you're going to have those uh, talk shows about medical health, you can patient advocacy, rights, uh, maybe a little politics and cannabis. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do game shows. We're gonna do comedy series. We're gonna really get into everything that you'd see on regular TV, but from the. Uh, the weed point of view. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And Mark, you um, you recently have um, thrown your hat in with the whole group that is uh, that uh, is going for dispensary and cultivation and stuff like that. Um, what's your experience been with that? Well, it's interesting because first we entered it from a uh, standpoint of media, but as we got educated about who was doing what and how they were doing it and what their vision was. You know, we we just said, wait a minute. If some of these people that are applying, all due respect, don't have any experience in this area, maybe they have a name or they're a politician. If they could do it, you know, and they're going to do it mediocre, why don't we do it and do it really well? Because through Weed TV, we have access to such incredible industry leaders, and we really took a whole different approach to the vision of this. Well, and you know, it's not just the media approach to the vision that I was talking about. The the building that you guys are hoping to occupy and hoping to get a space in is a huge facility. And and you were telling me partly about your vision of this being a wellness center, like a wellness destination. Yeah, you know, it, it, there's really three components of it. There's It's an 18,000 square foot building. It was the old port tax and your frogs on a... a 3190 West uh, Sahara, and it's two stories. It's actually a beautiful old Spanish building, and the whole concept was to create a destination. Let's create a wellness center with a with a with a vegan cafe. Let's create a media center that does research development with a digital library and help educate people and produce programming. Let's also have the dispensary, and let's connect all these together in a synergistic way. Um, which is something no one else is doing. Uh, just one example, you know, let's say you go get your medical card. Um, well, imagine if you went into a doctor and a pharmacist says, here's a prescription and it's blank. Go into the pharmacy and get whatever you want. Well, that's essentially what a medical marijuana card is. If you go in, you're going to ask the, the, the person, who, the dispensary, gee, what you know, strain should I get or what this, that, and the other. And they're a salesperson and you only have so much time with them. But if you can go into the wellness center and sit down with a, uh, a, a naturopath or a yeah. consultant and say, sure. you know, uh, you know, I I'm not eating right. I'm doing this. And maybe they're going to put together a whole program that's going to include exercise and diet as well as, you know, the proper medication for sure. what you're trying to cure. So that's kind of the vision. It's a one-stop shop for everything. And I like that vision that you're having because when, when I think of medical marijuana, that's exactly how I envision it. You know, everyone's needs are different, you know, but the doctor may prescribe Oxycontin blanketly, you know, for everybody. You know, you don't have the opportunity to say, you know, well, my back is hurting and this is what my diet is. So I wish you all the luck in the world with that. What, what you're describing here is the same thing that I've been imagining going on right here in Vegas. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, if you think about a modern day um, medical facility, you're going to go in and you get your x-rays. You're going to get your blood work. They're going to weigh you. They're going to bring you through everything before they give you a prescription. Well, they don't have that. So we're trying to replicate that in a logistic, you know, point of view yeah and in in one building not only not only can you get this consultant you know and um i I heard that you know you were talking about maybe nutritionists and reiki and some alternative types of healing um which really fit in with this natural plant um it more more so than you know surgery does uh in a surgery center um so i mean i i really wish you guys well um have you have you gotten any good or negative or, or positive or well, any feedback that you, you'd like to share? Well, or? Sure. Um, it's a very grueling process to go through this licensing. Not only have we applied for the dispensary, but also cultivation and production in North Las Vegas. Um, I know it's my first, I've been in Las Vegas for 24 years, but I have to say this is my first, encounter with the politics on a on a on this kind of level and let's just say not everyone's treated equally um i don't think we have been viewed um as far as our vision i think that people you know make comments and maybe give you recommendations based on whether they think they can get more votes or not so we hopefully we can break that that floor and we hope we could break through and make people realize that they really should go for the best people and the best applicants and not the people that are their friends. Because at the end of the day, if they make the wrong decision and give the wrong person the license, you know what, it's going to come back to them. And at least they say, Hey, we chose the best people because of this reason. And that's, you know, and that's just, um, that's one of the pitfalls of, of going into a special use permit licensure type of situation and that there are a lot of um, politics involved and a lot of uh, political navigation that you have to do and and you have to you know really know some of these people i i would have to say to really be successful in in some of that navigation Um, But I think that the basic concept of this wellness destination, if it would just be heard, um, and it has been heard by many, many people uh, and accepted that... um, that it would be it would be really well received in a community and we really need something like this our next our next story actually kind of has something to do with this it says is is this is las vegas going to be the next amsterdam (laughs) well i would certainly hope not because last time i was in amsterdam it was it was not a great great experience it was a very you trip dirty, too hard? No, it was dirty, you know, run down, you know, kind of, you know, vagrant kind of just... Tawdry? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The red light district was like overflowing, I, let's just put it that way. So. You just didn't... Uh, well, I was going to say, I, I guess it's maybe this the idea of Amsterdam. <laughs> Has anybody else been to Amsterdam? Uh, many times. Yeah, well, well, what do you think of Amsterdam? You know, Amsterdam is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. There's canals, and I think it's more beautiful than Venice when you think of a place that's sitting on the water. Um, there's a lot of art. There's history in there. There's Anne Frank House. There's a lot of uh, uh, the Picasso, not Picasso, uh, Van Gogh museums there. There's a couple big ones. Um, Amsterdam has got a lot of culture and history, and you know, and part of the culture and history is that red light district. No different than Las Vegas is known for gambling. They're known for you can go into a cafe and sit down. But I don't think Vegas is ever going to get to that point. I think the way the regulations are, if it ever becomes recreational, it means you can buy it and smoke it at home. You're not smoking in a bar. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but. I don't hope. I hope we don't. I'm 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 optimistic of of not having bars per se, but coffee shops. You know, if we can walk up Fremont Street and the Boulevard and all that w- with our yards of alcohol, why can't we? <laughs> and our leashes and harnesses of alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. People Just wearing like leashes, and, and you got some of these cups are about the size of them, and I'm three foot ten and a half. Okay, some of these cups are like four foot tall. Okay. <laughs> Uh, taller than me but i want to have the opportunity to go to a coffee shop much like uh 
crap bucks, you know, and sit on my <laughs> laptop and, you know, be able to socialize with my peers and network. You know, I want to have the opportunity to sit there and try different edibles with, with my coffee. You know, that is what I'm hopeful for, you know? Uh, yeah, actually, I am. I, I was just, that's funny because, Kurt, I guess if you visit the armpit, that's what you're going to see. But <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, next I mean, time, go to the museums or something. Yeah, I, I actually took a train about a, about 30 minutes west of Rotterdam, and it, that was beautiful. It was, you know, I wasn't being harassed by people, and it was it was a much nicer experience than I had in Amsterdam. So. I, I was 24 years old and backpacking and went to a Madonna concert in Rotterdam, so I was there too. <laughs> yeah. And it's much nicer out there than it is in Amsterdam. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and you can get all the same stuff you can get in Amsterdam. You just You just got to ask the right people, you know. <laughs> Well, I guess that's exactly right. You can almost, you can get almost anything as, as long as you know who at, who to ask, right? <laughs> so they don't think that Nevada's medical marijuana laws differ than most states because we have the reciprocity um, and out-of-state medical marijuana patients can come here to Nevada. Um, but again, it's for inside use. When we, they were talking about that special business licensing... Um, it wasn't on Saturday. <laughs> what? It said, wasn't for in, inside juice on Saturday. Oh, that's true. <laughs> At Hip Fest, there were like freaking, there were clouds of smoke. Oh, you want to know something incredible? What? It is we, you know, be in the media, we are covering everything going on. Not one fight broke out. That's right. Not one medical thing. Nobody got chipped away. Nothing. Yeah, the, you I know, was it's just it's just a testament to, you know. I was so talking to good. one of the police officers like uh, two hours before the event ended, and uh, he told me there were zero incidents. <laughs> so. You know, and if you look at EDM or the Electric Days EDC, look at what they had. They had a couple of medical events their first day. Yeah. You know, people OD in and whatnot. You know, we didn't have any of those situations. And people's comments about, oh, you play that type of music, you host that kind of event. You know the kind of people that you have come out there? You know who I saw out there? My neighbors. I saw people with children out there. I saw I, dogs. <laughs> exactly. I saw police officers that were off work, you know? So there was a lot of people there, you know, from the community. You know what? The only thing that, that happened at Hempfest is maybe a broken nail or something. But seriously, there were no incidents. There were... Everybody seemed to get along. Cur B says that there were a lot of broken cookies out there, but, you know. Broken dab nails suck. Broken dab oh, nails, my, my maybe bad. a broken that pipe. <laughs> um, that, that's about it. Everybody seemed to get along. It was a really great spirit of community um, with everybody there. We have a caller on the line. Dan? Hi, Dan. What's going on? Well, I had a, a question about growing yourself. Sure. Yeah. And, um... Currently, as I understand, you can have, you can grow 12 plants. You have to register your name um, with the state on the address that you're doing it. My question is, how many people with cards can grow at that residence, for instance? Well, you know what? With Metro and with SCORE, it seems to max out at about three until they start looking at you real heavy. But they really shouldn't. Um, it really shouldn't matter. But it seems to be that people aren't getting a lot of flack, at, you know, in two and three. If you're all legal patients, it should not matter. And you all live at that residence. It yeah, should I, not matter. I would say make sure that your grow doesn't isn't a majority of your home also. Because if they come in and a majority of your house is a grow, they're going to look at it as a grow house, not a residence. And my advice would be... My advice would be that if if you are growing with more than one patient, make sure that you have the approval letter from the state attached to the door of where your grow is. And each patient's license posted up there also. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Right on. Yeah, well, we were, you know, every every plant that the patient has is, is marked and then no, the patient's number is on it. Well, that's really great. Kurt and I grow at the same house, and we just have copies of our licenses on the door. Um, and I even circled the apostrophe after the S and put plural cop. Yeah, but we also we also keep our limits to at least half of what they allow us. Well, we, that's we just because our room that. isn't that big. Right. But whatever you do, Dan, keep safe and make sure that you're legal. 
um, with everybody in your household. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and thanks for listening. And thanks for listening. All right. We have a break coming up. When we return, we'll have our 420 moment and more. With Mark Bradley. The Von Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Locally owned and operated TSI Total Safety Incorporated has kept our community safe since 1998. We provide superior services offering professional installation, local fire and burglar alarm monitoring, and the fastest response times in Las Vegas. We also offer armed and unarmed security, video security systems, access control, and fire safety installation and service. All of your security needs are covered. Call us at 702-967-0000. That's 702-967-0000 or visit us at TSIVegas.com. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. That sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment. Uh, today we're going to honor, in honor of Hempfest, Jack Herrer. All right, Jack Herrer. I was born June 18th. 1939 and he's been called the emperor of hemp he wrote a best-selling book called the emperor wears no clothing and it was and it's been instrumental in helping uh some legislatures here in uh, nevada to understand the wholeness of this cannabis and this hemp movement Uh, i gave his book to people in carson city to read so that they would know that cannabis was more than just a medication that it was a plant for industrial use for food for fiber for textiles and for everything um formerly a goldwater republican hair was a pro cannabis and hemp activist he wrote two books um like i said the emperor wears no clothes and grass uh there's also been a documentary made about his life the emperor of hemp he believed that the cannabis plant should be decriminalized because it's been shown to be a renewable source for food, fuel, and medicine, and it can be gr- uh, grown virtually in any part of the world. And so this 420 moment goes out to you, Jack Hare. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add one little thing, uh, okay. an interesting note about him. is At the, be- the beginning of his career, he was for hemp, and he was anti-cannabis. He was totally dead set against cannabis as medicine until one of his girlfriends told him you need to try this and after trying it once he became one of the largest champions of medical cannabis there ever was and you know Jeannie got up and spoke it at hemp fest uh, these past weekend and she did a really great job she's a really nice person so our 420 moment goes out to you Jack and Jeannie Herrera I'd like to add that oh. uh, you can uh, see the entire documentary and weed TV the Emperor of hemp uh, yeah. Coincidentally, I actually edited segments of it this morning, which I'm going to be using in our HOA presentation to educate them about the whole industry. Great. See, so it, it truly was a, a 420 moment, meeting of the minds, for sure. <laughs> for sure. All right. We're back uh, in studio with Mark Bradley. He is the CEO of Players Network, and he also has a baby network called Weed TV. That's one of our favorites. Um uh, I'd like for you to tell us, is there any way that people can become involved with Weed TV or Players Network? Um, Let me, yeah, th- there's a, a lot of ways people can get involved. First of all, with our technology platform, in about 30 days, there's going to be the ability for anybody 
to create a sub channel and their own little TV channel, their own little, little network within the umbrella of weed TV. So if you have a voice, anything within the weed industry or hemp industry or something related, something to sell, something to talk about content, you'll be able to build your own channel, which is something I'm really excited about. We think it's going to change a lot of approaches to broadband networks and social communities. Um, as That's we great. All, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool stuff. And uh, number two is, you know, we're also in addition to media business, we're looking at brick and mortar business. Uh, we're going to build the Weed TV studio within our dispensary destination, part of our media center. And uh, we're a publicly traded company under the stock symbol PNTV. So if anybody wants to own a piece of a dispensary or a piece of a cultivation or a piece of a weed TV, they could simply go out and buy stock. It's only like two or three cents a share right now. All it's, right. a, it's a steal. So, so look at the pink sheets. Uh, look at the pink sheets and you can buy stock. PNTV? Yeah. PNTV. Paul, Nancy, Tom, Victor. Right on. Um, I wanted to go back to the, you said the media destination. When uh, you were explaining this to me off air, we were talking about the, you having a media studio inside um, inside the dispensary and you described it something akin to like a public access network. Like you remember how people used to have like public ac access shows like Wayne's World. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I bet it's true. So uh, this is going to bring that that kind when, of media back to maybe Las Vegas? Yeah, when I was uh, 19 years old, moved from Chicago to uh, Los Angeles, my first job was selling cable TV door to door. And I found out the cable company had a, a public access department. And I had a photography background. I realized I could learn how to do lighting and how to do camera work. And here I am in Hollywood, you know, might as well look at TV. And sure. I, I joined their public access department and it changed my life. I mean, I learned, you know, skills that I still use today in my everyday production. I learned how to do editing, how to produce, how to direct, how to do multi-camera shooting. And, and uh, nowadays it's a lot more digital than mm -hmm. it used to be. Yeah. But once the cable companies kind of drifted away and satellite came in and broadband and everyone they had no need they already had their license they had no need to give back to the public the fact that we're going through this privileged license thing yeah. and, we're, and there's a community outreach which is an important part of it i'm reinventing something that really worked well and that's dear to my heart which is a public access program where interns can learn how to get college credits for learning different parts of digital media mm -hmm. and where any member of the public can come in doesn't have to be about hemp or marijuana they can come in certain days a week and shoot a half an hour tv show and air it on the internet do whatever they want with it and we're it's part of our give back program to the community now that's what partially what really intrigued me is that not only this would be uh, this uh, dispensary would be a destination for wellness but it'd also be a destination for for people that um, may have ideas about what they want to see on on TV or what they want to put out there to the world and and it's something that you uh, you personally have you know really touched your heart and and that you're giving back to the community nice. so thanks for doing that you're welcome. It's my pleasure all the time. <laughs> yeah, it kind of runs along the lines of uh, I was I was actually producing a te television series of my own, and I just ran into the fact as my camera guys and the location all fell through and that. So to have a place that I could go and do that now, I mean, to me that's that's huge. And and I know I know I'm not the only person out there who has ideas that we want to get out. So you know, once again, thanks. So. All right, so um, more on to our local news. Finally, it's a great call. They're talking about not limiting the grows in Nevada uh, to a million square feet. The Division of Public and Behavioral and, uh, Health announced that it would not uh, invoke their discretionary authority to limit the amount of medical marijuana grown in Nevada. And they said it before the meeting, we are not going to do this. Yeah. And then Tick came up and said, we're not going to limit the grow. And then Jackie came Then up. Jackie came up, Jacqueline Holloway. From business licensing. Uh, and, yeah. and I think that's important because if you look at what happened in Colorado, you look at Washington, you know, you don't know what kind of grow. I mean, just, just as I said earlier, you know, you got some people 
involved in this that are going to be potential owners that have absolutely zero experience in cannabis whatsoever. You don't know what kind of people they're going to bring in. You don't know what kind of lights they're going to use, what kind of grow programs, anything else. So it's important that, you know, all that they were growing would count against the, what, the million square feet that was proposed? Yeah, it was about a million square foot of canopy that was proposed. I think that uh, Tick Seegerbloom said it best. He was one of the authors of this bill. He said, we want to attract the best and the brightest applicants, make it a for-profit model, and let them come here and compete. That's really important to me. Um, and Tick Seegerbloom basically says that if they can grow marijuana better, let them grow it. We want it comp competitive here so the prices will come down and it's affordable to everyone. And that's what I'd like to stress. When you kind of limit the the amount that people can grow, then the prices will go up. Now, the business owners, to me, have personally complained um, not Mark, but no, some, some other, some other dispenser, I mean, some other cultivators were complaining to me that if they let too many cultivations in, that um, it would bring their prices down and then they couldn't afford to grow it. And at that, at that, at that juncture, wouldn't I say that, you know, capitalism, let the market, you'd let the market dictate who's going to, who's going to win. And, and that, that's, well, that's very important because if, if you got somebody trying to get medication in there, their medication is like a hundred, two hundred dollars a quarter, and they can go on the black market into their friendly neighborhood drug dealer and and get a bag for like sixty, seventy-five dollars. Somebody, especially those that sincerely need their medication and are on a fixed income, those are the people that are going to be going to that. There were other people that were commenting about that. They were they were say, basically saying when you limit the market and the price is too high, then the black market is not eliminated. And so you have to have you have to have prices that people can afford, um, because the novelty of going somewhere and being able to choose from like five, six, seven different strains will wear off when it's three hundred dollars or five or six hundred dollars an ounce or how many you know how much ever an ounce it's going to be. Right, and when we get to the story on Oregon, they talk about... Um, well, why don't we talk about Oregon? Okay, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those things, man. Potato, potato, I always get stuck on that. Uh, Oregon rolls out legal pot plan. The Oregon initiative would allow people to grow up to four plants in their home which is prohibited under Washington's marijuana law. Mm -hmm. Oregon would allow users to possess eight ounces of pot for recreational use at home. And they're um, stressing at home compared to one ounce in Washington. In the wording of the 35 page ballot measure, it assures that there would be plenty of other differences from legalization of marijuana than in Washington. Um, there are 70,000 Oregon's, uh, Oregonians, I guess, who have medical cards and they can buy their, their pot from more than 150 different dispensaries there. Um, they also are going to use laboratories to check out all the, all the cannabis, just like, just like Washington. So there are some, there are some really, um, there are some similarities there and there are some difference. Well, the initiative would also allow for a single business enterprise to grow, possess, and sell marijuana. There would be no driver impairment level set for THC. Woohoo! So basically, it means that they're not going to test the nanograms per deciliter in your blood. They're just going to say, are you impaired, and give you some type of test, are you impaired. So what would the test be, do you think, for DUI? They hold out a brownie, and if you snatch it, you fail? <laughs> Maybe it's some Doritos. You know, I have a real mixed opinion about this here because if you think about it, um, right now people aren't getting DUIs and they're not being brought into jail saying because of pot. So no. why are things going to change now, you know, because it's there's a certain amount of legality to it where you can't be imprisoned for it? Well, I think I a lot of it is uh, people are afraid that that the police are going to lose, okay, I can't make all these arrests now for, for possession, so they're going to turn to another revenue source, and they're going to uh, just basically abuse the system and start pulling people over and saying, hey, I smell it, we're going to test you, and there, there you go. That's how they get their money, you know? 
Yeah, I understand, but then it's going to get down to, you know, does one strain have a stronger smell or scent or or react more? I mean, it's just, it, it's way too early to even think about that. Well, I, I would say that that's the truth also. And I used to use an ozone machine outside my uh, grow room, and it takes all the smell off your weed. Yeah, but it also takes a lot of the taste away too because those terpenes are more than just smell. <laughs> So. Well, back to my Oregon. <laughs> Taxes on recreational pot would be much lower. And a study by Equal Northwest for initiative uh, says recreational marijuana could sell for $145 an ounce. What? Oh, that's fair. A that's, zip for $145. That's yep. pretty good. As Did, long as it's not tweeds. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that Oregon State has one of the highest marijuana use rates in the nation? I could have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have one of the highest fruits and some of the most skilled growers who grow renowned strains of pot on uh, secluded rural acreage, much of, it, much of it down in southern Oregon. Well, I would tell you, I know several people um, that have traveled to Oregon to to do internships on pot farms so they can learn it's so they can learn to trim so no that's so they can learn to grow to and grow. to learn to breed and to learn to make their own uh strains jack hare did what he was from oregon, he was from oregon. oh wow. there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um there's a strain actually named after jack so i the, think we have there actually is and i can't remember what it is i saw it in the it's documentary jack hare is it yeah, it's called Jack Hare. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I don't know okay. if it's a sativa or a, or, or a kush, though. It's a, is, it's is a, it a sativa dominant strain that has gained much renown as his namesake. Uh, it is a combining a haze hybrid with Northern Lights number five and Shiva Skunk Cross Sensi Seeds. So, <laughs> All right. It's, uh, it was designed to capture both the cerebral elevation associated with sativas and the heavy resin production of indicas. It's a rich genetic background. gives rise to several different variations of Jack Herrera, uh, each phenotype bearing its own unique features and effects. However, consumers typically describe this 55% sativa hybrid as blissful, clear-headed, and creative. Just like Jack, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thank you, Beach. So, what have we, have we got anything else out of Oregon? Nah. No. Nope. Well, you know what I found in one of my laboratory magazines? No, but I'm sure you'll tell us. <laughs> you know I will. There was a study uh, in California about traumatic brain injury. Traumatic out of almost 500 people in California that had traumatic brain injury that they urine tested. Um, I think it was like it was like. 80 patients of those 500 had marijuana in their system. And of those 80 patients, the people that had marijuana in their system were much more likely to survive. They were had a, like an 11.9 survival rate combined uh, as opposed to like a 2.5 survival rate. So basically they're saying marijuana is linked to lower death rate for traumatic brain injury patients. And this is straight from my laboratory magazines. This is what I found amazing in the last, uh, and this came out in the American Surgeon Magazine, um, that THC uh, may help protect brain in cases of uh, traumatic brain injury, researchers have to say. Um, these brain injuries were similar, uh, all similar, and so they can't say the you know the people that smoke pot had less um, had less of a um, of a brain injury. They were all similar cases, but they had lower death rates across the board. I thought that was amazing, and I think that that's a good reason that we should give it to all our troops because that's what the troops uh, that are in Afghanistan and every and over there. They're not dying anymore because of all the armor and the body armor and, and all the accoutrements of war that we have. People are actually getting uh, traumatic brain injuries and, um, and um, being paralyzed and stuff like that from, uh, as our soldiers instead of dying. So it's, it's a good thing for soldiers beforehand and also after for PTSD. Yeah, well, there was just a recent study in 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine um, 
and uh, nearly eight in ten doctors approve the use of medical marijuana. So, and ninety-two percent of patients say medical marijuana works. Well, I don't know. I think that's kind of skewed. So, well, if you're a medical marijuana patient, you're already a believer, right? Well, now a wide-ranging survey in California finds that medical marijuana patients agree. That ninety-two <laughs> percent said that medical marijuana alleviated symptoms uh, of their serious and medical conditions, including chronic pain, arthritis, migraine, and cancer. And that data came from the California Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. <laughs> right on. So it was a California a study. <laughs> all right. When we get back, we're going to be talking about all things cannabis. We're here with Mark Bradley from uh, Players Network and Weed TV. We'll be right back. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. All right, we're back with the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is Jennifer Solis. I'm joined in the studio by Kurt Dukoch, Raymond Fletcher, William Beach Baker, and our special guest, Mark Bradley from Players Network. Um, coming into the news, I think Raymond has something from his hometown. Me and Mark's stomping grounds in Chicago. Number of marijuana-related arrests are still too high. According to DNA Info Chicago, the percentage of people fined for the possession of marijuana has increased over the past year. However, an activist group is questioning why more than 60% of those found in possession are still arrested. Charlene Carruthers, the National Coordinator for Black Youth Project, says that Chicago Police Superintendent Gary McCarthy has said over and over and over again, we should be ticketing, not arresting, but it still happens. The city spends $80 million a year processing marijuana arrests, despite the fact that both McCarthy and Mayor Rahm Emanuel's proclaimed reforms intend to replace marijuana arrests with revenue-producing ticket citations. $80 million a year in processing arrests. You know, the city of Chicago has enough problems with their gangs and their drugs and their violence and their crappy school, but we can't talk. We're 50th in the nation. Oh, yeah. Well, we can't talk about schools. Yeah, Nevada is 50th in the nation. But you know what? I think that um, in Chicago, like New York, is it also, is it also related to race? The arrests? Yeah. Directly uh, the, rated. Well, she's from the Black Youth Project, so what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if she was from the White Youth Project, and I'm probably the only person in this room that can say this, I think if she was from the White Youth Project, she'd be called racist. Well, well I think that's if true. you tried to start a White Youth Project, you'd be called white racist. <laughs> 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 I, I, I love the double standard. Well, okay, back to the subject in hand, not race wars, guys. Come on. I, what I'm saying is in New York, they found overwhelmingly that the, the stop and search people, the people that were getting arrested in the stop and search laws were overwhelmingly um, were overwhelmingly African-Americans and um, Hispanics. 
and that they and what I my point to that was like if they did a stop and search near Wall Street, they'd turn up a lot of coke <laughs> and other things probably. But yes, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Along those same lines, though, and uh, uh, CU Boulder posts a huge drop in pop punishments. So the University of Colorado at Boulder does not believe that the the drop in disciplinary cases relating to marijuana had anything to do with the new law legalizing recreational pot for citizens 21 years or older. They don't? What do no, they think it no. has to do with? They say the number of students disciplined for drug violations dropped from 1,145 to 588 between 2012 and 2013. Wow. So. Huh. That's so almost a 50% drop. Wow. Yeah, and... Uh, and uh, they say they, says, it's not related to marijuana? Yeah, it was uh, voters in Colorado approved Amendment 64 in November 2012 creating a new state law to legalize recreational uh, use of marijuana. It didn't go in effect until January 1st, 2014. So, I wonder what can it, be, it could be attributed to. Hmm. hmm. Inquiring minds. Inquiring minds want to know. I guess there's less freshmen. <laughs> That's what Beach says. There well, may no, be they freshmen. said that the drop in discipline cases was due to a new approach in disciplinary matters. Oh, so they changed. Yes. The behavior of the students didn't change. Yeah. The the way that they were viewed was changed. They found it more. Well, there you go. They found it more effective to provide education to students on first time offenses rather than punitive disciplinary actions from the start. Wow, oh. you don't say educating people. Educating. I don't know how many times we said that. Don't educate through fear. Educate. That's right. Speaking of education, October 2014 is Vegas Cannabis Magazine's inaugural issue. And we have quite the space in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, um, if you came out and saw us at First Friday or at Hempfest, we had these, uh, these magazines available for free. This is a free publication. It's going to be... Uh, uh, telling all sorts of different things. There's lots of, uh, in this uh, first issue, there is five amazing things you didn't know about of marijuana. They have uh, witch strains and breeding. Uh, they do a cannabis-infused coconut oil recipe in there. I, I looked at the cannabis-infused coconut oil recipe, and it <laughs> looked a little light to me. Yeah, it looked a little light to me, too. I mean, I usually make mine about four times that strong, and mine is nowhere near as strong as some of the people I know who make it, so. Hmm. Five amazing things you don't know about marijuana. Let's just highlight one of them. Marijuana triggers neurogenesis. In layman's terms, it leads to brain cell growth. Hmm. Well, mm. Wait a minute. I thought smoking marijuana killed brain cells. It does not. And as the traumatic brain injury article uh, highlights, it actually is a neural protectant. We're actually replenishing the uh, cannabinoids in our body that were killed over the last 50 years when the junk food industry and chemicals and everything came into our lifestyle. We used to have enough in our body to fight them off. That's why replenishing them in ourself uh, will make us better and live longer. Well, I would have to say that since I switched to just cannabis and uh, no other medication, I, I even don't, I, I try to, to even take aspirin or ibuprofen and then switch to a mostly organic diet that I seem to get sick less. I seem to not get as tired as much and I seem to do better um, overall mentally and physically. Now, here's another quick note in here in their, in their events is this radio show. Really? Yeah. We're in their events. The weekend, That's awesome. 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour every Tuesday from 4 to 5. Woohoo, woohoo. So, Raymond, you got anything for us local? I don't have anything local, but I have a list of the biggest donors to the anti marijuana lady. Ooh. <laughs> My list of haters. It's the Haters Club. The battle for marijuana, both medical and recreational, are deep pocketed entities who have a stake in the outcome. You one mean the, like Big Pharma? Exactly. One of the loudest megaphones in the debate is the Partnership for a Drug-Free Kid. You know, I'm getting tired of this. Partnership for a Drug-Free America, right? You know, people think that those that medicate are going to be sitting there and medicating around children, okay? But they don't have a problem these parents drinking and didn't get in a, in a car and fastening their kids in the child seat, but whatever. Or either that or telling their kid, go get me a beer. Right. But the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, formerly known as the Partnership at Drug-Free.org, 
formerly known as the Partnership, Partnership for Drug-Free America. Oh, why did they have to change your name so many times? I think there may be issues. <laughs> I'm looking into that one. I'll get back to All you. All right, on get that. back to me on that one. But Who, it, there's the egg the, people. Well, aren't the Koch brothers also big ant haters? They are. But the uh, p the partnership is funded by special interest groups, which means Pfizer cor corporations. And by law, the organization must make public its donor list. And six of the top contributors of a quarter of a million dollars or more are. Abivi, a biotech company responsible for Humira, a drug um, that treats arthritis, arthritis yeah. and has earned them more than $10 billion. How It's funny how they can be anti-drug when everything that there is is a drug, a drug, a drug. You would think. <laughs> Are they against themselves? You have consumer health care products, the leading trade and lobbying organization for makers and sellers of over-the-counter drugs and nutrition supplements. CVS. Ah! CVS. <laughs> who ordered more than 1.8 million oxycodone pills. You got Malin Rocket, Mal, Mala whatever. I'm Malin Crot. I know who they are. They're, they're a huge pharmaceutical company, both in Europe and in America, with animal and human applications of opioid painkiller medication. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacture of America, they represent the interests of 48 pharmaceutical companies and wow. Purdue Pharmaceuticals, maker of Oxycontin. Oh. I, guess, I guess these pharmacy companies are starting to get a little shaky in their feet right now. They might get hit in the pocketbook, huh? Uh, you know what? When in the, in, at legislature, in the eleventh hour, Pfizer sent a bunch of people up there to to fund campaigns, and they they promised people campaign money. And I said, I said, but they couldn't take money. And they said, I know, but when Pfizer walks in and says we'll give you a million dollars, you tend to trust them. Do you guys ever think? You know, I've been thinking about this lately, going through this process here and having a uh, dispensary application. Do you ever think insurance is ever going to pay for medical marijuana just like they do for regular? Drugs. Yes, there are cases that are going on right now that are working their way through state Supreme Court where one person had gotten workman's compensation. Oh, remember yeah. that? Yeah, and a workman's this, compensation was paying for their cannabis. Wow. Okay. So the times are changing, man. Yeah, we saw that on Saturday. Speaking of times of change, and if you guys have extra time on October 28th or 29th, come out to the city council meeting um, and be in support of um, the dispensary that we're talking about. We're talking about a dispensary that's a destination and that will allow wellness, uh, you know, and and whole food medications and naturopathic um, solutions. Called Green Leaf Farms. Green Leaf Farms. Green Leaf Farms. And then... This Saturday, we have our patients meeting at the Coffee Bean, tea, and, bean, bean and Tea Leaf. leaf. I never get the name of that. Coffee Bean right? and Tea Leaf on Maryland Parkway from 2 until 4 p.m. If you'd like to understand more about the cannabis movement, if you need to have some medical issues or needs, come out and see us. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. This is like a medical support group for cannabis patients. That's right. And check check our calendar at WeCan702.org for all of our upcoming events. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. And, and sure take a look at PNTV if you want to own a piece of a dispensary and cultivation operation yourself. And no, we 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 com And, and if you miss Weed <laughs> Fest... Hemp this, Fest. The Hemp Fest. Uh, if, hemp, you mi if you missed Hemp Fest, it's going to be streaming TV. on WeedTV.com on Friday. So please go and sign up today at WeedTV.com so that you can watch Hemp Fest for free on Friday. And that's about all the news that we have. Anybody got else? Any announcements? Nope. No, we will be back next week. Thank you, Mark, for coming in. It's my Thank pleasure. Thank you, Dan, for calling. Thank you, Lawrence, for making us sound great. Be safe, everybody.